Here is the question about a spring, which I asked at the end of the previous part of this lecture. So what you need here is Hooke's law. But note that we are looking for the magnitude of the force. So who cares about signs? We're not looking for an x component. We're just looking for a magnitude, and magnitudes are positive by definition. And second of all, note that the thing that appears in Hooke's law is not the length of the spring. It's the amount by which it's stretched or compressed. This spring has been stretched by 5 centimeters, or 0.05 meters. Just multiply that by the stiffness, and you get a force of 1 newton. Forces exerted by springs are position-dependent, and in the next unit we're going to see a special way of dealing with position-dependent forces. But now let's turn our attention towards time-dependent forces. And for this we're going to have to pull out something that we haven't seen since I just mentioned it way back in Unit 4, when I told you that the change in momentum for a non-isolated system is something that we call the impulse. Well, we can finally do something with that now, because we know that the rate of change of momentum is the vector sum of forces, and so we ought to be able to relate that to impulse. So although we're looking for a way to deal with time-dependent forces, let's start with some constant forces acting on some object over a time interval from some ti to tf. And because the forces are constant, the acceleration is constant, and we don't need a derivative. We can just say that the acceleration is a delta v over delta t. And let's multiply both sides by the inertia, and we get this, which brings our delta p into the equation, and we can solve for that change of momentum. But look at that ma hanging out there. We know what an ma is. That's the vector sum of forces. So we can just plug that in, and we get this and our delta p is the same as our impulse, and so we've managed to relate impulse to the vector sum of forces. This is the impulse equation for constant forces, and we'll generalize it to non-constant forces in a moment, but let's just stop and interpret it for a moment. It's vectorial, so let's think about the x component. So here is a sum of x components of forces versus time for this constant set of forces. And note that there's delta t, and there is the sum of the x component of forces. And when you multiply those two together, that's going to give you the x component of the impulse. But look, it's just the area under the graph. And in what I hope will be a very familiar looking argument, I'm going to show that this will apply not just in cases of constant force, that we'll always be able to find impulse from the area under a force versus time graph. So now I just make the same argument that I did in Unit 3 when I was showing you how to get a change in velocity from a time-varying acceleration. We just divide up the area under the x component of force graph versus time into a bunch of rectangles of some arbitrary width delta t. And now we let that delta t go to zero, so we're thinking of making narrower and narrower rectangles, more and more of them, and they become a better and better approximation to the actual area under that graph. And so we get our x component of the impulse as an integral of the x component of the vector sum of forces with respect to time. Or we can just define the vector then as the integral of the vector sum of forces itself with respect to time. Here's a ball hitting the floor, and we know its velocity before it hits the floor, but not after. But perhaps we have a force plate or something, and it's recorded this force versus time data. So, I have drawn the free body diagram for the ball during its contact with the force plate. All there is is a force up due to the force plate and the downward gravitational force, and the ball must be accelerating upward during the bounce off the force plate. And I'll just note that the gravitational force on it is about one newton. When you have a force versus time graph, that's a hint that impulse is going to be useful. So I've written that my y component of impulse is just this integral of the sum of the y components of the forces. And I've written my y components of the forces. But notice that gravitational force is tiny, so I'm just going to neglect it.
So that reduces the impulse to just an integral of the force due to the force plate with respect to time. Now I know you don't know how to do an integral, but it's just this area under this curve, and you don't need to know any calculus to know how to take the area under a triangle. From that, the rest of the solution proceeds easily because we know this is related to the change in momentum, which we can express in terms of the velocities and solve for what we're looking for. The next force we're going to look at, which is variable, is drag forces. We've looked at position-dependent forces now and time-dependent forces. Drag forces we've seen depend on relative speed. So here's a different type of non-constant force, and let's see how to calculate them. So we know that drag forces depend on relative speed. They also depend on the cross-sectional area. So for two objects, an object that is bigger will have a larger drag force at a given speed. It also depends on the density of fluid, so drag forces for things moving through water tend to be larger than drag forces for things moving through air. And finally, it depends in ways that are often rather difficult to calculate on the shape of the object. Some objects are more streamlined, and that reduces the size of the drag force on them. The formula you can use looks like this, and you can see the speed in green and the cross-sectional area in blue, and the density of fluid in purple, and the coefficient, which is called the drag coefficient in orange, is something that encapsulates a whole bunch of information about the shape of the object and comes up with a number. Let's check your understanding of drag forces and your understanding of how to deal with forces in two-dimensional situations. So here is a Nerf ball, and a Nerf ball is just a ball that is made out of low-density foam, and so drag forces tend to have a significant effect on their motion. So this Nerf ball is going 10 meters per second at a 60 degree angle above the horizontal. I've given you its inertia, its cross-sectional area, and some other information you'll need. Find the size of the horizontal component of the acceleration of this ball.